And I would say that I've always been invested in forms of materialist analysis, as well as in forms of critical engagement that marshal intellectual tools for social transformation. But I also came up in a world that we could refer to as the belly of the beast, meaning the heart of the US empire, and did my early training in the 1990s. And so if you were in the 90s like me looking for radical theory, what was on offer was French theory and German style critical theory. And that's what I was drawn to because everyone around me was saying, well, this stuff is really changing the nature of the conversation. It is profoundly radical. Uh, you need to know these things. And so uh, one of the elements they think that we'll get into in the conversation is that what I didn't know then, but that I now see very clearly retrospectively, is what I refer to as the intellectual apparatus. And this is drawing on the work of Brecht and many others. It's not like some concept I invented myself. Uh, it's part of a collective tradition of critique. And the intellectual apparatus is the entire system of intellectual production. So everything that goes into the production of ideas, this is universities, think tanks, the media, mass culture, so-called high culture, etc. But also the entire system of circulation. What ideas become part of the public sphere, circulate widely, are translated into other languages, what ideas are not circulated widely, and also consumption. Right? Because there's a system of pre-programmed consumption that means that certain ideas are those, like myself, growing up in rural Kansas, uh, was apt to consume because it was what was on, on offer. And so when I came to Paris, in the, I came in the mid-90s, and it was really the tail end of the grand era of French theory. And I began studying with Lucie Rigori, then I did my master's with Jacques Derrida here at this institution. And then kind of went and took classes with anybody that I could who was really famous in what I now understand is the global theory industry. Uh, Chris Deva, Sik Su, Paul Ricoeur, Lyotard, uh, La Ruelle. Then I discovered Alain Badiou and Jacques Ranciere. I ended up doing my dissertation with Badiou. And so I kind of just dove uh, wholeheartedly into these traditions. And one of the things that I realized, given my dedication to materialist modes of analysis, is that First, I felt very insecure and in that I needed to train myself in a whole series of things. And so I learned all the languages that I needed, and I thought, well, Derrida is the most prominent thinker, so I need to know Greek, I need to know Latin, I need to know German, I need to know French, and I need to know English. And so I taught myself those languages, and I dove into as well not just his work, but then all of the work that he was reading. So the kind of canonical history of Western philosophy. And in doing that, I discovered that there were unspoken parameters to his theoretical practice. And so another key notion for me is a theoretical practice. I'm interested not simply in what people say or their ideas, but in their material practice qua intellectual. Not what they say they do, but what they actually do. And what Derrida actually does, I realized, and it ended up ended up becoming both my dissertation and my first book, is he operates within a historically constituted intellectual practice that I would now refer to as bourgeois philosophy. And in bourgeois philosophy, what you do is you focus on a specific object of analysis, the canonized texts of the Western tradition. You uh, concentrate on the quote-unquote genius producers of those intellectual products, so you know, Leibniz and Kant and people like that. And thirdly, you engage in internal analysis, right? One of Derrida's most famous claims is that you can never analyze the context until you've exhausted the text, but the text is inexhaustible. So you never have to deal with the context, right? Both Foucault and Ranciere really do, it's, a, it's also a kind of pseudo-materialism because when you compare what it is they're analyzing to their framework of analysis, their framework of analysis is highly idiosyncratic, right? And so in my engagement with both of these thinkers wasn't just reading what they wrote, it was reading all the things that they wrote, or, or the, that they were reading, and then comparing them to other analysts of the same topics, and finding that, well, that's really strange that you know, someone like Foucault would say that, well, there's no longer these uh, like horrific displays of corporeal punishment anymore. Like, this is in an age of Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib. Like, what planet are you on? And lynchings, and like, just look at the history of the United States. Like, you can't just make these massive transcendental demarcations and act as if um, you know, this idiosyncratic version of history mapped onto actual material history. 
And so by comparing and contrasting their transcendental accounts of history to other material accounts of history, I recognized that they were highly limiting and that also they were largely premised on trying to come up with some like absolutely new and individual understanding of the world that no one had arrived at before. And one of the powers of the historical materialist tradition is that that's not how it works. Like one individual doesn't rise above everyone else as a saintly figure and bestow upon humanity the gospel. No, people work together to figure things out and we have more brain power when we work together. And it's a collective tradition of elucidation, right? And so that idiosyncratic nature, I think, is, it also is just part of their brand management because ultimately what they wanted to do was to ratchet up their symbolic capital within the global theory industry. And you don't do that by working with others and by developing modes of analysis that are collective. You do that by saying, everyone else is wrong. Here's my new concept. Here's my new idea of the 19th century. And I find that now, in retrospect, to be not only problematic, but ultimately to be a product of how commodified intellectual production operates under the global theory industry. And I've tra I should probably have said, I've trafficked in this myself, like mea culpa. Uh, for sure. There's plenty of my own writings where I look back at them and cringe and think, oh, that neologism doesn't, or neologism doesn't really explain anything. Uh, it's not helpful. It's just me trying to wave my hands and look, you know, more impressive than somebody else. So I probably should have led with that because my own critiques, I think the beginning points of all of my own critiques were self-critique. Uh, and when 9-11 happened and the political stuff that I was talking about earlier, actually that was the worst. It wasn't as bad that Derrida couldn't explain it. It was that people were asking me, you're this sophisticated Parisian intellectual, what's going on here? And I was like, well, I don't know, you know, différence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty embarrassing. And so the motivation for a lot of this critical orientation was really a self-critique and realizing that I didn't have the tools that were necessary to understand. The way I would describe it is that there's a difference between theory that has exchange value, meaning theory that is marketable, trendy, hip, gets lots of likes on you know social media, sells a lot of books. Um, Slavoj Žižek would be a good example of that, and he's a pseudo theorist whom I have attacked quite directly on this front because I'd, I'd juxtapose theory with exchange value, theory that can be monetized, to theory with use value. Uh, Michael Parenti would be a great example of someone who has really done an excellent job of elucidating the history of U.S. politics um, and, for that matter, foreign affairs as well, in such a way that average people can understand it and they can act on it. And in my own experience, I, you know, I was trained originally in a very highfalutin form of obtuse French theory and did my PhD in France under some of the kind of leading luminaries of these traditions. So what I was supposed to do with my life is become a kind of guru in this exchange value driven theory world. And it wasn't working out because <laughs> I kept reading this theory. And given that I have a working class background, I grew up on a farm, I've always been invested in radical politics. I wanted to make it relevant. And it just became increasingly clear to me that it was completely irrelevant. And my work over the last, I don't know how long it's been now, maybe six to 10 years, has really pivoted much more clearly to a uh, theory with use value. And the rewards are uh, obvious uh, in the sense that I've been involved with a whole series of activist campaigns that have been successful. I've been involved in uh, public political education that has been very successful. And I've also just really connected with both my roots and where I'm coming from and other working class people and young people who are facing a world where they need ideas and they need theory because you have to be able to frame your experience in a broader world, right? You can't just, if you just go through the world and you're, you know, on social media and stopping by 7-Eleven to get coffee and, you know, you don't have a higher view on what it ex exactly is that you're experiencing it and why the world is the way that it is. And so you need theory in order to do that. And I'm a very, very strong believer in the, the power of theory to abstract from the immediacy of our experience so that you can you know, situate your consumer experience within something like capitalism and capitalism within the deep history of the colonial expansion of, of Europe and other such things. What's your response to a lot of people saying that 
some of these works are actually helpful. Never mind their complicity, actual material complicity uh, with empire and capitalism. But the frameworks that they offer are helpful to understand the world. What's your response to that? Well, I think that we have to look at this from a systemic vantage point and recognize that there is a form of intellectual imperialism such that these figures work has been promoted globally as the most important, sophisticated, radical, developed, etc. And that requires then a really essential question. Would the imperialist intellectual apparatus willingly promote work that is not in its best interest? Would it promote, for instance, the work of Lenin and Che and Sankara and Fidel Castro? Or would it instead try to, and in certain cases successfully, kill those people and eliminate them? Uh, and instead prop up figures whose work serves their interest, right? If you are a star within the imperial theory industry, it means that you are doing something that merits you being promoted as a star. And we have to see this as a system, not simply in terms of individual cases. Does that mean that then uh, everything that every one of these intellectuals has produced needs to be condemned and we should start burning books or something along those lines? No, not at all. I think one of the themes, and I really appreciate the fact that you're teasing this out of our discussion, is the refinement of dialectical analysis. Dialectical analysis, among many other things, means that you always look at the different dimensions and the different levels that are operative and all of the different relations, right? So, for instance, Foucault, I think, is a very, at least at times, sometimes he's obscure, but he's a very good writer. He has rhetorical flair. He's able to conceptualize at, at interesting levels. Um, someone like Pierre Bourdieu has a concept of the habitus, which I think is quite powerful and should be recuperated and integrated within a Marxist understanding of the kind of dispositional and embodied aspects of ideology. So there are elements within bourgeois intellectual production that I think can be of use in various ways. And it also makes sense because these are intellectuals who, unlike most intellectuals in the global South, or many intellectuals who are just against actually existing capitalism, these are intellectuals who are given the best material conditions for intellectual production, right? They basically don't have to work. All that they have to do is, you know, they don't have to teach. They don't have to hustle. They don't need a side hustle. They've got research assistance. They've got endless money. They can travel the world. They can publish wherever they want. These are ideal conditions. And under those conditions, it would make sense, hopefully, that bourgeois intellectuals would produce something that might be of interest or of use at certain levels. And so I think that from my vantage point, what's important is that their theoretical practice is primarily invested in exchange value. They're playing to empire. They're developing idiosyncratic conceptual vocabularies and intellectual brands that allow them to elevate their status within the imperial theory industry. They are not producing knowledge grounded first and foremost in use value for the human collective that is trying to change the world, like Lenin, Walter Rodney, and some of the figures I mentioned earlier were. Therefore, there is a strong incompatibility between those two. But again, we might be able to find certain elements. I do not think, and this is a strong position that I take against a lot of Western Marxists, that eclecticism somehow improves Marxism. That Marxism and a little bit of Foucaultianism or Lacanianism or, you know, other versions of that would somehow help. I've gone through many, many instances or Freudian psychoanalysis for that matter. And you don't advance a collective scientific project by mixing it with ideology. What you do is you pervert its fundamental substance. And so I don't know if that helps kind of tease out my positions on this, which it one and the same time are very clear and, you know, oppositional towards the exchange value theoretical practice that drives the imperial theory industry, while also recognizing that, of course, there can be certain elements that one might want to then use, draw on. But I think one should be careful and do it in a very vigilant manner. Um, and the compatible left does allow for a certain uh, margin of maneuver, if you will. And you can have internal debates within that compatible left. 
But the most important thing is that the compatible left is lined up ideologically on what the capitalist ruling class wants. And the two pinnacles, really, or the two touchstones for that are that you have to be against actually existing socialism in hopefully all of its manifestations, but at least the overwhelming majority of them, right? Yeah. Because someone like Badiou, for instance, supported the Maoist cultural revolution for a few years, but is anti-China otherwise across the board, right? Yeah, yeah. And you have to be pro-capitalist or at least be accommodating with the capitalist order. And so what so many of these figures from the Frankfurt School to the present agree on is many of them say capitalism is a horrible system. And they'll describe it in minute detail and kind of phenomenologically how horrific capitalism is. It hijacks our desires. It hijacks the way we think about the world. It penetrates into the deep inner sanctum of our libido and all of these things, some of which are absolutely 100% true. And there are also insights that are taken from the Marxist tradition. But they, at the end of the day, line up on the position expressed by Winston and Churchill, of course, who has a well-known record as being a barbarian in the, you know, in the colonial enterprises of the British Empire. And that is that capitalism is the worst possible system, but there isn't another one. And there's no alternative, right? Yeah, and so yeah. what these thinkers yeah. do, and that's their social function that Boyan, you pointed out as well, is that they are with corralling potentially insurgent elements within the population into potential intellectual and discursive critiques of capitalism, but ultimately a rejection of any alternative to capitalism. That's why they've been promoted. That's why they're the superstars. They're the superstars not because they're the smartest people on earth or they've introduced the most interesting philosophic system. It's because they have a very good nose and they've had that nose to the winds of the capitalist cultural apparatus and they smell exactly what it is that the system wants radicality divorced from a real alternative to the capitalist world and that's why they're promoted so widely so uh on a scale of one to ten how many of your colleagues hate you no i'm just kidding don't answer that <laughs> you don't have to answer that um well, no, well, let me ask staying on the academy for a minute um do you think that i mean a do you think that the academy as it's structured in the united states is in any way an incubator for ideas that shift the status quo um and if you don't or even if you do do, do you think at any point it used to be more so the i mean the u.s academy has always been very hooked into uh imperialist interests uh there's been you know the if you look at the history of the national security state, a lot of the OSS that became the CIA came out of the Ivy League universities. And so the idea that there was kind of a golden age of universities, you know, if, if you go back to the 40s or, you could, or, you know, 50s and 60s, but you could also go back to the 30s or go back to the 19th century and all the like support for slavery and eugenics and other such things that you find in the university. There wasn't a golden age of the of the American university, but there were certainly moments where there was a much more kind of radical vein to some research that was being done, right? In the 1930s, you do find that. And in the 60s and 70s, you do find some of that around the new left stuff and 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 whatnot. Um, it usually still remains somewhat marginal. The university is an interesting site because I think it's also, and I'd be curious if you have thoughts on this regarding like journalism and the mass media, because one of the things that's kind of interesting is it's caught in a little bit of a contradiction because the way the university and the media presents itself is, we're free and everybody's equal and it's just an ivory tower where all ideas matter, et cetera. When in fact, these are major corporations that are in bed with imperial and pro-corporate interests in very profound ways. Like the April Haynes, who's, who's taking over the CIA, she was working at Columbia University. You know, there's, there's not just a rotating door between the university and the national security state. There are operatives who basically inhabit both locations more or less at the same time. And so... But given the fact that the university and the mass media presents itself in this way, there's a really interesting contradiction where at times they have to allow for an autonomy of ideas that would uh, give a platform to, you know, people like me or people like you or kind of alternative voices, you know, trying to contain it within certain limits so that they're not featuring me on CNN right now, right? Or I'm not on the, the New York, I've published a lit, little bit of stuff in the New York Times, but They've rejected a number of articles that had to do with the CIA. 
And so they, you know, they give this little margin of maneuver. And I think it's really important for people of, like us to use that margin of maneuver because it's a contradiction between the, the real social function of these institutions, which is to reproduce inequality and spread the dominant ideology and how they present themselves to the public, which is free and open and everybody has free speech and things like this. And so within that margin of maneuver, we can do certain things. But my own work is not just invested in doing what you can do with extant institutions, but also developing counter institutions uh, educationally uh, at the level of media platforms and whatnot as well, because I think that uh, the kind of to echo what you were saying earlier, if you want uh, a nicer, greener capitalism or do you want a socioeconomic system that people decide on on their own? And so I'm very invested in popular education, you know, and platforms and projects that do this these types of popular education um, that aren't beholden to creating hierarchies within the classroom and to doing the kind of social triage of sorting out who's going to be the next members of the professional managerial class and who's going to be sent to work in a factory or work in gig labor or other such things. And so in my own work, I have a kind of two prong approach. Do what you can within the margins of the institution, but don't have any illusions about the institutions because we also have to build power outside of the institutions from a kind of bottom up grassroots perspective. I like that. And uh, since you touched on this in your answer, um, I got to ask, what are some of the things you submitted to the New York Times that they wouldn't publish? So I got uh, hooked into, uh, I did a few pieces with the Times and they have this uh, opinion section uh, that where philosophers will write and do kind of public intellectual work. And so I did one or two pieces and they, they circulated, but they were more personal and existential and a little bit less political. And then I did a piece on the CIA reads French theory, and it explored the way in which the national security state had a vested interest in kind of postmodern theory uh, coming out of France, knowing what it was, what its social function was, and then also supporting it in uh, in quite concrete ways. And so I sent that to the Times thinking, well, I, I wrote these other pieces and kind of got my foot in the door. And one of the pieces kind of went viral a little bit and got translated into a lot of languages. So I figure, you know, they want clicks and stuff because they're looking for their their advertising base. Mm -hmm. And so can I can I make that contradiction work for myself? But that didn't work. Um, so well, what, any, were, what were the theories like, like go into detail on that? Like what were some of the theories that they were subscribing to? Uh, with the, who were the, the, the CIA? Yeah. Yeah, so the CIA is, and actually I ended up publishing that particular piece in the Philosophical Salon, which is on the LA Review of Books, if people want to check it out. Um, the CIA had a vested interest in moving the Western intelligentsia away from communism and to positions that they refer to as the non-communist left. And so they were funding journals, publication platforms, conferences, translations, and they were pouring tons of money into enormous international conferences with literally tens of thousands of people attending the conference and not just academic conferences. These were conferences that were getting written up in like Time and Life magazine and things like this. And they were all basically anti-communist propaganda. And they were aiming to, as I say, kind of edge the Western intelligentsia away from communism and towards uh, what's interesting in the case of Europe is they targeted socialists, um, but reformist socialists who weren't revolutionary socialists. And they actually, the CIA was going back behind the back of Congress because they knew that the kind of, you know, uh, anti-communist Congress would not have supported the U.S. government uh, giving funding to socialist platforms. But the CIA, and these are, you know, smart people who are trained in the Ivy Leagues, and not that being trained in the Ivy Leagues necessarily makes you smart, but what I mean by that is they're, they're like serious operators, and they're not fucking around when they want to get something done. And they understood that the best way to do this was you divide the left, right, and you sever off the anti-capitalist left from the pro-capitalist left, or at least from the reformist left. And that that's a gradual process. And so if you can at least get rid of the communists to start with, then little by little, you can move further and further to the right. And that's what we've seen over time, right? In the post-war era in Europe, almost all of the visible intellectuals were Marxists because all of the fascists and all of the liberals who had collaborated with fascists looked pretty bad after all of the information about the concentration camps came out. And so if you wanted to be anyone with 
a little bit of street cred, you were open to Marxism. But then the postmodern theory that rose to prominence in the 60s and 70s was largely anti-Marxist. And that was exactly in line with the interests of the U.S. national security state. And they were not only anti-Marxist, they were not critical of American foreign policy and American imperialism, whereas, of course, the Marxists were. And so driving that wedge into the intelligentsia was really significant. And the fact that then French theory would be imported into the United States as the most cutting edge and radical theory ever invented is a big part of this project. And it's not just the national security state that did this. It's the major corporations and the foundations that backed a lot of these projects. So when when postmodern theory arrived in the United States, many people point to the 1966 conference that took place at Johns Hopkins with you know, if your viewers or listeners know people like Derrida and Lacan and the kind of famous postmodern theorists, they were all invited to this conference and it was funded by the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation gave a ton of money to this particular conference and then follow up seminars and whatnot. And so this was an importation of French theory that was anti-Marxist. They didn't invite any of the Marxists or any of the real Marxists. And this was part of uh, an intellectual world war, quite explicitly so. And the Ford Foundation, of course, worked hand in glove with the national security state. So you shouldn't think that, oh, this was private and then the, the CIA work was different. You look at the history of the Ford Foundation and then tons of these people were also working for the national security state, just as the same as the case with the Rockefeller Foundation, with the Carnegie Foundation. This is the you know, big leagues of the, of the corporatocracy. And the CIA is in bed with all of these people. They work for these people. And so all of that story, of which there are many other components, is what goes on in to this project that I mentioned, the intellectual world war that I've been working on. And it really explains why, like, I shouldn't be, uh, I'm not exactly a, vo you know, a voice in the desert, so to speak. There are lots of other kind of more progressive academics that are out there, fortunately, but I should be one of thousands and thousands, but I certainly don't feel like I am one of thousands and thousands. I can't believe the New York Times wouldn't want to publish such a thing. That sounds uh, that sounds right up their alley. When I, I mean, you know, the 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 one of the outlets that helped lie us into the Iraq War. I can't believe they would want to they would want to publish such a thing. Well, um, actually, could 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 I get a dig in on the Times while we're talking about it really quick? Of course. So so the Times, you know, the 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 director of the New York Times from 1935 to 1961, right? This is decades was Arthur Hayes Salzberger. And he signed a confidentiality agreement with the CIA, which is the closest, it's the highest level of collaboration that a news outlet can have, meaning that he had regular confidential conversations with the CIA about the stories they were running, what they were going to run, how they were going to tow the CIA line, etc. And so the history of the corporate or the mass media in the United States and its ties to the national security state is deep and very, very dark. Um, there's a great article by Carl Bernstein that goes into some of this. There's the church uh, committee report that goes into it. I mean, the, the CIA uses tons of journalists as, as, as operatives, um, like literally hundreds and hundreds of journalists, both domestically and internationally. Uh, who's the guy on um, the kind of uh, the pretty boy, older gray fox guy on CNN? Uh, what's his name again? Uh, you know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah, Anderson I do Cooper. Know. Yeah, Anderson, Anderson Cooper. Cooper. Yeah, he interned with the CIA like two summers in a row or something like that. Like I might be wrong about the details, but he has CIA connections. Like mm -hmm. this is how that world works and people need to know that. The dominant understanding of the Central Intelligence Agency is mediated by the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, I have a quick quote here, or quick notes here. So 1,947 screen products TV shows and movies have been supported by the Department of Defense. And 114 screen products have been supported by the OSS, CIA, FBI, including, for one screen product, these are long-running TV shows like 24, Homeland, etc. So the James Bond film, Mission Impossible, there's a, there's a lot of great scholarship on this, but National Security Cinema is one of the solid books on this. And so what they've done is they've created the image of themselves so that people are confused about how they actually operate. This is important because the Central Intelligence Agency is 
And it came out of the Office of Strategic Services, which was the wartime intelligence service. And of course, a deeper history of MI6 in Great Britain, who they learned from and then incorporated and, and collaborated with. The Central Intelligence Agency, they, they largely have two branches that are important. One branch that has been widely studied and understood, uh, Killing Hope by uh, William Bloom is one of the best books on the topic, is the death arm, right? The Central Intelligence Agency has been responsible for killing a minimum of six million people worldwide between 1947 and 1987, according to 14 former members of the Central Intelligence Agency who did a study in the late 1980s. So that, there's that element of all of the coup d'etat, destabilization efforts, etc., overthrowing a minimum, or attempting to overthrow 50 foreign governments, the majority of which were democratically elected since World War II alone. Right? But the other element that is unbelievably important and understudied, and it's one of the reasons that I got interested in it, is research and analysis. Uh, the OSS, the predecessor organization of the CIA, was, uh, had set up a research and analysis branch. The numbers vary uh, depending on who you look at, but between about 1,200 and 2,000 full-time researchers were working for the OSS. And this was the model for the Central Intelligence Agency. They um, actually recruited an innumerable members, a number of university professors, particularly from the Ivy Leagues and the elite institutions, to do research and analysis globally. This is a big part of what they do. In fact, according to two analysts that I know, the OSS uh, research and analysis branch was the largest think tank or largest um, grouping of researchers uh, in the history of the United States and set the agenda for post-war American social science, right? And the people involved in the OSS, there, there's many of them, right? Uh, Herbert Marcuse, um, Franz Neumann, uh, a lot of the leading luminaries of the kind of post-war social sciences. In fact, if my memory serves me right, seven presidents of the American Historical Association in the post-war era were former OSS members. And the joke, in the CIA is that nobody ever leaves the CIA. So former is a bit of a euphemism. It means that you're an intelligence operator and you have contacts to the bourgeois state. So that is an important context, I think, to understand. The other thing that I would say is that you shouldn't get hung up on the CIA. It's like, you know, as soon as you bring it up, people, even people in the know, uh, it will evoke a whole series of connotations. There's a lot of other agencies involved in this type of work. Um, not only the intelligence agencies, but also the private intelligence agencies and um, a lot of other uh, various governmental agencies. And the central goal of the CIA is to internationalize capitalist social relations. And if they do it through the stick, or more perhaps appropriately, the gun, or they do it through the carrot of propaganda and through the carrot of the mind management of global humanity, the objective is the same, right? So the CIA is not the real story. The real story is who they're working for, right? They work for the capitalist ruling class and they work for bourgeois states in order to manage the global population. Ralph uh, uh, McGee, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his last name, but he was in the CIA for 25 years and he said that the central function of the, of the CIA is global disinformation. Right? That's why. I think this organization is important and understudied. And so that's one of the reasons that I kind of turned to and began um, investigating some of the work that they were doing, in part because I kept coming across references to work that they were doing. And some of my early work looked at the rise of American art in the post-war era and why the center of cultural production shifted from Paris to New York City. And there's a lot of great work on this. Why did the abstract expressionists and uh, the pop artists and all these people become so famous? Well, the Central Intelligence Agency was actually really deeply involved in promoting it. And they worked with uh, the, the private museums in the United States. They uh, pour funds into supporting US culture because part of the goal was they didn't want the global population to think, think that the Americans were crass and that they were just chewing bubble gum and smoking cigarettes and you know, drinking Coca-Cola. They wanted uh, the global message to be they're reading Faulkner and going to see Jackson Pollock. They're a sophisticated, I mean, it's basically like Imperial Rome, right? They wanted to project an image of imperial power that wasn't just Walt Disney and like crass base 
culture. And so they funded and supported it. And that was one of my kind of gateway drugs into this, this world. And then I began to discover how much they were involved in the intellectual world. In fact, according to the Church Committee report in 1975, the CIA was involved with thousands of academics at hundreds of universities. This is a quote. Right? That is an enormous, enormous operation. Uh, the deeper you dig into this, though, the more complicated it becomes, because I found out that the person who wrote the church committee report himself was CIA, and the report was vetted by the CIA, and that the exploration of both the academics and the journalists, because an inordinate number of journalists who are CIA, was cut short because the people who were investigating in this congressional investigation began to discover, wow, there's a lot going on here in the university and the journalistic world, so they cut it off and said, okay, we'll, we'll do what's called a limited hangout. Limited hangout in intelligence parlance is you give people a little bit of something so that you can then control the narrative, right? Um, so that was kind of part of the background. And then maybe one of the other things that's important for the work that I'm doing now is that uh, unlike a kind of standard image that some people have of the CIA where you know, somebody come with a briefcase full of cash and, and leave it in a professor's office and then the, you know, the professor's going to write some, you know, really crass propaganda or whatnot. That does happen, and I've seen a lot of examples of that happening. But it actually mainly functions differently, and that is that they control the apparatus of intellectual production. The entire system of production, circulation, and consumption is not just you know, controlled directly by the CIA or something like that, but they have a hand in so many different aspects of it, along with a lot of other agencies and along with the foundations, Ford, Rockefeller, Carnegie, etc., which are basically you know, their, uh, their ways of managing capitalist wealth for intellectual and cultural propaganda. And uh, if you look at the history of these foundations as I have, they work hand in glove, right? So the Ford Foundation has a CIA liaison. You look at the history of who worked for the Ford and who worked for CIA, they go back and forth. Uh, these are hand in glove operations. Rockefeller's the same. Nelson Rockefeller himself was a super coordinator of US intelligence and oversaw the CIAA, which was an intelligence and propaganda organization for all of Latin America. Um, and so there's, we have to see the kind of larger picture and not think, oh, there's the private world over here where there's the capitalists and then there's the public world. Um, this is liberal mythology. It's, uh, they, they work really, really hand in glove. And so uh, I guess connecting this to some of the theoretical elements, I began to ask really basic questions like, well, why was some curious you know, farm boy from Kansas like myself drawn to Paris and French theory? Like, how did that happen? And what were the kind of systemic coordinates that put me on that particular path? And I looked into the history of French theory, its reception in the United States. And I always knew, oh, there's this famous conference in 1966 at Johns Hopkins where they brought over French structuralism. And many people have written that this was the grand arrival of French theory. And I began to look at, well, who was invited and who was paying for this? Right, really basic material questions, which I think we should always ask. Well, the people who were invited were not people like Louis Althusser, because he was a member of the Communist Party. So he was a Marxist, and he was a persona non grata in the kind of, you know, the remnants of the McCarthy era US uh, political orientation. Um, so there were Marxists who were invited, with the potential exception of Lucien Goldman, who's a debatable figure. Um, so there's already a filtering, right? It's the kind of transatlantic translation regime, make sure that the people who are circulating are the people who should be circulating. So Derrida, Deleuze, uh, Lacan, people like this. And it was the Ford Foundation who invested millions of dollars in this conference and then a series of publications and other conferences related to it that brought this phenomenon. And knowing more about the history of the Ford Foundation and the type of cultural production, they were interested in the promotion of intellectual anti-communism globally, right? And that was part of the project. Uh, the piece, if you had time to read it, on the Frankfurt School also looks a lot into this, right? Where was their funding coming from? It was a capitalist ruling class. Why was a capitalist ruling class doing this? They, they say it, like I quoted in the article, they, they funded them because they were towing the line that they wanted major intellectuals who were radicals to tow 
in particular doing things like Horkheimer did, supporting the US imperial intervention in Vietnam, or the French, uh, British, and Israeli imperialist intervention in Egypt, right? They were doing the good work that the capitalists and imperialists wanted them to do. And so we have to think of this dialectically, right? It's not, and unfortunately there's been some slander campaigns, unsurprisingly, against me. It's not that there are, you know, these intellectuals who are just, you know, getting cash and then like writing what they should write and things like this. Instead, there's a phenomenon of uplift. And if I think about it in, in these terms, the intellectual apparatus, this entire system of production, circulation, and reception, which is a big part of the superstructure within capitalist societies, has an enormous amount of control. And within that, if you want to climb your way up, you're an undergraduate, you want to go to grad school, you want to do a postdoc, you want to maybe get a job, maybe you want to get a job at a prestigious university, we all know how to do that. You do not do that by becoming, I don't know, a specialist in Thomas Sankara. You do not do that by um, you know, trafficking in ideas that are linked to transforming the world. The way you do that is you give to the intellectual apparatus what it wants. And there's a kind of suction that is like uplift. And the more you give the system what it wants, the higher you'll rise within that system. And again, I should, uh, I have trouble being so self-deprecating at times because I'm like, oh, I tried so hard to do well. But I suffered from this enormously, right? The reason I got a job is because I was hired as a French theorist and I translated Grancier into English. And doing that meant that I was invited to junkets and I got keynotes and people were like, wanted to cozy up with me. I was feeling important and I was feeling relevant because I was doing radical theory. Right? So um, it hasn't served me well to understand better how that system works and think, I don't want to uplift in a system like that. I don't want to be contributing to that type of uh, overall orientation. Great. That's an expansive question, but a great place to start. So I first encountered Zizek uh, as a young student in the early 90s uh, in the United States when a lot of the dominant discourse was deconstruction, kind of postmodernism, poststructuralism. And Zizek bursts onto the scene, being labeled this kind of, you know, Lacanian, Marxist, uh, radical, dangerous thinker, etc. And I shared with you the kind of enthusiasm of a young person who, personally, I was generally ignorant of history, political economy, uh, the history of class struggle. I'd been educated, after all, in the imperial core, and therefore I lacked really fundamental reference points about just the nature of the world that I was living in. And there was something sexy and cool and exciting about someone who could talk to someone like me. And I do really think that Zizek pitches to uh, the youth culture in general and is a kind of uh, force for bringing people in at a, at a certain level. But the difficulty with that is that his most profound insights, of which there are very, very few, are all borrowed from the Marxist tradition. And what he does is he mixes those insights in an eclectic kind of homo fashion with non-Marxist and often anti-Marxist discourses and modes of analysis. And what you're left with is a kind of cultural mashup where you still get glimmerings of the Marxist tradition, but they've been commodified. And they've been commodified because of the way in which they've been crushed and subjected to ideological elements from the larger kind of theory and culture industry. And so it did not take very long for me to figure out that Zizek was not someone who had a really robust uh, political and philosophic project that was actually linked to the liberation of the you know, global working class. Uh, he struck me as someone who had a careerist, uh, you know, orientation and an opportunist orientation. And even though I could sense that early on, it became confirmed much later on as I got to know his work better. In the case of the translation that I did, I ended up publishing, I'm sorry, translating a book by Jacques Rancière, who is an anti-communist anarchist. And uh, I didn't have my politics fully sorted at that point in time and thought that there was something more to Rancière than there actually is. And I was mainly interested, actually, in his aesthetic work and some of the history of art stuff that he's done, some of which is solid, but again, suffers from an anti-communism and a lack of materialist analysis. But that's another story. In any case, in the case of uh, Zizek, the only way that I could get a translation published 
that I had already uh, worked on was by finding someone who had a lot of credibility and symbolic capital within the theory industry who would be willing to preface it. And so in short, I was given the condition that I could you know, publish this translation if Zizek wrote the introduction for it. And this itself speaks volumes to the way in which the global theory industry operates and also how we need to understand it. Because at the end of the day, my critique of Zizek is not an ad hominem critique. It's not a critique of an individual person. It's a critique of a system that produces someone like Zizek and promotes him as the most important thinker, the most dangerous thinker, et cetera. And so the fact that I would be basically obliged, if I wanted the translation to come out, to work with someone who is a charlatan and an opportunist really demonstrates how that whole system works. And it just became much worse after I ended up accepting that because he ended up writing the preface basically to a different book than the one that I had translated, but wanted me to go ahead and write, you know, just basically change the title of the book and run it anyway. And so that revealed to me and very close up because I'd been working in Paris at that point in time with Derrida and Badiou and other kind of leading luminaries of French theory. It revealed to me the kind of crass nature of his intellectual production. And I'm not the only one who has had kind of close up stories. Anyone who's kind of in the mix, so to speak, knows that Zizek is uh, not only sloppy, but kind of takes pride in being someone who will, you know, uh, simply not follow up on his on scholarly rigor in any really serious way whatsoever. And so anyway, there's there's that aspect to it. But then to come back to your kind of uh, larger question, which I think is really important, is that a lot of this work then addresses the question of the global theory industry. And so the critique that I just put out of Zizek is part of a larger book project, which is tentatively entitled The Intellectual World War on the Failed Attempt to Kill the Idea or the Very Idea of Communism. And it looks at the material forces that have been marshaled by the capitalist world in order to denigrate not only actually existing socialism in any manifestation that it takes, but also uh, all of the theoretical work in the Marxist tradition and to replace the historical materialist tradition with a kind of compatible left uh, traditions of thought. And in the case of those like Zizek or Badiou or Hart or Negri or Ranciere, Judith Butler, we could add a lot of people, Ernesto Laclau, Chantal Mouffe, we could, the list goes on and on and on. This is a a very particular segment of the global theory industry, because of course that industry is actually dominated by people like Samuel Huntington and Francis Fukuyama, who do the kind of direct bidding of U.S. imperialism. But The role of these particular figures that I just mentioned is that they're radical recuperators. What I mean by that is that they are tasked with and have tasked themselves with producing purportedly radical discourses that call everything into question. The history of Western metaphysics, the existence of man, uh, enlightenment, uh, Europe, European thought in general, all of these grand kind of monolithic things. And they appear to be Uh, unorthodox and uh, transgressive and liberatory in various ways. But if you go through the details, as I have, because I studied very closely, not only this tradition, but within this tradition, was trained within this tradition. And unfortunately, for a long time, quite honestly, I believed in certain aspects of this tradition. You realize that they are all profoundly anti-communist. There are different versions of this, and it takes on different forms. But They're principally against what they refer to as totalitarianism, which is, of course, a kind of originally it was a concept that was developed in the communist tradition. But then it was recuperated by the U.S. national security state and uh, intellectual figures like Hannah Arendt in order to discredit actually existing socialism and try to affiliate it with fascism, which is an impossible intellectual task because they're, you know, world historical enemies and fought World War Two basically uh, around that kind of or was constructed around that opposition between fascism on the one hand and and socialism on the other. And so that critique that I have of of Zizek is part of a larger critique of the radical recuperators and the function that they play in the global theory industry, which is to recuperate the possibilities of radical critique within the anti-communist camp and the anti-socialist camp. 
in other words, what they do is they police the left border of critique. And they also are part of an imperial project, a project of cultural imperialism, because as everyone knows, I, or I presume a lot of people know, who are familiar with intellectual traditions outside of the United States, there's a way in which those who are promoted within the imperial core, within the Euro-American world, become kind of uh, sacred values in the larger globalized uh, intellectual world. And so if you're in Argentina or if you're in South Africa or if you're in India and you're an intellectual and you operate in certain circles, it is almost a requirement that you have some familiarity with Foucault or Badiou or you know people of this ilk, Derrida and others, even if you tend to disagree with them for whatever reason it might be. And that's not the case with the thinkers who have been excluded from this tradition, right? Those who maintain a more historical Marxist, uh, I'm sorry, a historical materialist mode of analysis. So that's another function that they play is they play a really specific role as radical recuperators within the larger system of cultural imperialism. This is not research that I found on Wikipedia or that, you know, was on some blog. I've done uh, in, uh, unbelievable number of Freedom of Information Act requests to get internal documents that aren't available, uh, but that are now, some of them are uh, available as part of the public record. I've done interviews, I've done archival research, um, I've actually, you know, of course, read a lot on the history of the intelligence agencies and things like this. So the things I'm about ready to say that might be surprising are based on uh, verifiable facts, and often I, what I do is I always, you know, cross-reference and compare and contrast. And so a lot of what I'm going to tell you is based, it's straight from the horse's mouth. These are intelligence operatives in MI6, CIA, FBI, etc., who have admitted what they were doing. And there are two organizations, at least, that I think should be on everybody's radar. One is the Information Research Department. The Information Research Department, or the IRD. This was set up by the British Foreign Office. Uh, it worked with MI6. MI6 is just the kind of CIA equivalent, more or less, within uh, British intelligence. And it later worked closely with the Central Intelligence Agency. The role of the IRD it was set up in 1948 by the Labour government. Right? By the Labour government. Uh, and uh, actually, well, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Because um, it's important that it was a Labour government. It is an international anti communist propaganda research center uh, that's secret, uh, private, and has had unbelievably far-reaching consequences. It uh, has contacts with newspapers and magazines and news agencies, and it runs publishing houses. It had its own publishing house. <coughs> it worked with academic institutions, radio stations, um, regularly collaborated with the BBC, with London Press Service, with Reuters. It placed its people in the media and in the academic world. Um, this is a quote, just to sum up. Uh, this is by Hugh Wilford, who has a, a, done some good scholarship on this. He says, by 1950, the IRD had succeeded in establishing permanent channels for the routine transmission of its by now considerable output of anti-communist propaganda all over the world. Right? So they have a global network of anti-communist propaganda. If, does anyone know the story of George Orwell? and his communist list, right, he released a list of 135 suspected communists to the IRD, right? He, he was in direct contact with a woman who worked for the IRD. He, he's, he's a snitch. He gave them information on people that he thought were communists, and uh, the IRD had an enormous hand in making George Orwell what he is today, and why I read him in high school in rural Kansas, because they translated him into at least 20 different languages. They created an animated version of Animal Farm. They collaborated with the CIA on a feature-length film based on the same book. And they worked with intellectuals like Bertrand Russell, Arthur Kostler, Milos, Kravchenko, many others, and many of the leading specialists, quote-unquote, in the history of the Soviet Union were IRD. They worked with the IRD, and in certain cases, published books in which they took IRD files, put them in their own name, and then published them. In particular, Robert Conquest's book, The Great Terror, Stalin's Purge of the 30s, uh, drew extensively on IRD files. David Bar Barzillay, the Oxford historian, A.J.P. Taylor, 
Leonard Shapiro at the London School of Economics, Brian Crozier. The list is actually extraordinary when you go into it. And this made me think when I came across this information, I said, oh, that's why I thought that it was, you know, the Soviet Union was just blood and terror and horror and because they're pumping this stuff out. And it's given academic credentials. It's quite smart when you think about it, right? The way they've, they've done the operation. Because if, and they knew it, right? They couldn't just pump it out in, in pure propaganda and right-wing outlets. They wanted academic credentials. And they wanted, in particular, to work with uh, academics and intellectuals who had some left-wing credibility. And in particular, those who were communist dissidents, those who had lost the quote-unquote faith, as if communism was a faith as opposed to like an orientation that you would believe in because it makes sense or something like that, right? It's just a, that's a form of liberal projection in many ways. Um, so that's an important organization. The other organization is the Congress for Cultural Freedom, the CCF. The Congress for Cultural Freedom is a CIA front organization that, whose power arguably exceeded that of the IRD. It picked up on a lot of the work of the IRD. The IRD, the numbers of, they had about 400 to 600 full-time propagandists working for them. Right? Think about that for a second. What do we got, like 35 people here in the, in the room? Imagine if uh, you know, we had 200 or 400 to 600, and we had full-time funding, and the only thing we did was anti-communist propaganda, right? And we just pumped it out, pumped it out, pumped it out. That's an enormous amount of resources, right, in, in the intellectual apparatus. The Congress for Cultural Freedom far surpassed that. It was established in 1950. It had offices in some 35 countries. It mobilized an army of 280 employees, and it supported some 50 prestigious journals around the world. So it ran Encounter magazine, the Paris Review, Der Monat in Germany, Clove in Paris, uh, Quest in India, many others. It published at least 170 books. It ran Forum Service, um, which broadcast free of charge and all over the world reports from its intellectuals in 12 different languages. It reached 600 newspapers and 5 million readers. Right? Enormous operation. It was blown, the cover was blown by Ramparts Magazine in 1966, uh, investigative journalists who revealed that it was a CIA front organization, run by Michael Josselson. It was headquartered in Paris, and Michael Josselson was with CIA. And he referred to the Congress for Cultural Freedom as our big family, right? It was kind of like a mafia, right? Uh, our big family had a budget in 1966 of $2 million, which is the equivalent today of $18 million, right? And what's surprising, maybe, is that this was only a very small part of what Frank Wisner of the CIA called the mighty Wurlitzer. Uh, Wurlitzer was a kind of jukebox, and so he wanted and established a system by which, in Langley, Virginia, at CIA headquarters, he could press a button on the jukebox or on the Wurlitzer and have the same story play worldwide. If you were, I wasn't necessarily shocked, but I was flabbergasted by the lockstep of the global corporate media uh, when it was decided that the COVID crisis wasn't going to be solved and that we were going to pivot to war in Ukraine, war against Russia, war against China. That corporate infrastructure is still very, very prevalent. And I could come back to this, but you know, the CIA employed minimum 400 journalists, um, but it's most likely much, much more than that. Uh, it depends on what uh, different accounts you look at. This is Carl Bernstein's account in the mid-70s, I believe. Um, they also work hand in glove with the New York Times, with all of the major corporate media outlets. Uh, Cooper, what's his name? Anderson Cooper uh, interned with the CIA. Uh, Carlson Tucker apparently tried to get a job with the CIA. Um, I don't, apparently it didn't work out, but of course, Tucker Carlson is like William F. Buckley Jr. He gives to the system what it wants. It's almost people like that you don't need to employ them, you know, because they're already doing the work that you want them to do. Um, and there's much more that I could say about this because there are other levels to this. It goes much, much deeper. But I just bring all of that in because part of the agenda in the intellectual world war was not to fight a crass right wing war against the socialist alternative. The real goal was to split the left by shoring up what they call the compatible left. And the compatible left can be liberals, social democrats, Trotskyists, Maoists, anarchists, 
as long as, and that's the fundamental dividing line, as long as they're opposed to any and all forms of actually existing socialism. Meaning, as long as they say at the end of the day there is no alternative to capitalism, they're part of the compatible left. And so the agenda was to shore up the compatible left, sever it from the non-compatible left, the socialist left, and particularly the revolutionary socialist left, but you know, even not revolutionary, but just those who would support socialism, and to completely discredit and destroy the socialist left. So one of the things that's flabbergasting, finally answering your question, sorry for the detour, is that in 1966, it was revealed, and you can look at the global press at that point in time, that the Congress for Cultural Freedom was this enormous global propaganda organization that all of these intellectuals were involved in. Raymond Aron, A-R-O-N, not necessarily very well known in the United States, but one of the very visible philosophers in, uh, in France who wrote, um, is it the opium, uh, what's the title of the book, the opium of the, the intellectuals, I think it is. He's just anti-communist greed after anti-communist greed. Personal friend of Henry Kissinger, and he was the uh, face of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Right? He was also someone who was very important because he was the mentor to a lot of people uh, in the French uh, intelligentsia at that point in time, played an enormous role within French social sciences. Uh, Hannah Arendt was, had ties in various ways to both the intelligence services in, in Great Britain and to the New York intellectuals. Sidney Hook and James Burnham were philosophy professors at NYU, but they moonlighted as CIA. Uh, and so uh, the number of intellectuals who were involved was, was quite extensive. Uh, Horkheimer went to CIA conferences, you know, Conference for Cultural Freedom conferences. You look at the conference lineup, and they're all the kind of rat libs of the day, right? And so that blew up. And there's not a single reference in any of the figures that I've studied in German critical theory or French so-called critical theory that so much as reference its existence. <clears throat> not a word. Absolute silence. Right? And these are people who literally were at the same institution, studied at the same institution, studied with these people, often published with them, or themselves were involved in these jobs. Right? And so that, to me, communicated very clearly that this modality of so-called critical theory has its limits. And one of the fundamental limits is that it's incapable of criticizing the very institutions or the very intellectual apparatus that has promoted it as the best commodity on the market, right? And so if, just as a quick counterfactual, like imagine if in one of Foucault's seminars, there was one session where he said, oh, there's a Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was a CIA front organization, and all these French intellectuals were involved in it, and this is what the microphysics of power looks like. This is how institutions control and manage minds. Everybody, who's involved in the intelligentsia in some capacity would have caught wind of it. And you listening to me now, you wouldn't be surprised. You'd be like, oh yeah, he's rehashing that thing about Foucault that we all learned about like, a long time ago, right? Um, but in my case, the fact that I'm one of the, you know, there are others, of course, one of the people who's bringing this to the fore uh, reveals to me it's, I think, less interesting from a kind of subjective level than an objective level. What does this demonstrate about how this intellectual apparatus works? and what the limits of critique are within that intellectual apparatus. Um, and the limits, I think, are, are really clear. And then the other thing that I'll add to this, just the political horizons then become very clear, right? Because people like Adorno and Horkheimer, they were very critical of capitalism and consumer society and have written some very good things on that. Critique of the culture industry and um, various modes of analysis of how desire and need is constructed by capitalist social relations and consumerism. There are resources you know, within the Frankfurt School that I've read extensively and learned from. But as bad as capitalism is, the alternative is much, much worse. And so the heinous, racist things that they say about the Soviets, about the Chinese, about the Koreans, about the Vietnamese, about Latin Americans, they don't even talk about Cuba. 
You know, Adorno's family kind of went through Cuba, um, but there's no reference whatsoever to the, uh, the first major socialist revolution within the Western Hemisphere. And so it began to make me think a little bit differently about what this radical theory was that I was attracted to, and I thought, oh, okay, this is the compatible left. And, and, then, and then you start to connect the dots, and it all makes sense, right? Because when you think, and we could cycle back and should to like Zizek and Bedou, uh, would be interesting, because I studied with Bedou and I've read a lot of Zizek, uh, probably too much. And so uh, they're interesting figures, because you think, well, these people are Marxists, right? Like, wow, they're like revolutionaries, and you can tell from their book covers, because there's like <laughs> stuff on fire, you know, and they're like making symbols or wearing red or whatever. Um, but what's unique about them is that actually there's a fundamental consensus. And that fundamental consensus, there can be a little bit of wavering, and you have to look at the details. But they tend to be anti-party. They're against political organizing at a party level. Parties are bad. Parties are bad because when you're in a party, then you're organized in such a way that you, like, the rank and file is disciplined by leadership. And there's a focal point and modes of organizing that are hierarchical, that are top-down, etc., etc., which I'll just say as a side note is a complete misrepresentation of how parties actually work, um, particularly good parties. But we could come back to that if you want. The other thing is they're anti-state. They're against, they're, they're all for forms of resistance that do not succeed. As long as you're struggling and getting crushed, They'll support you. They'll say, yeah, we are, you know, some of them. It depends, of course. We have to look at the individual cases. But most of them will be like, yeah, we're in support of the Palestinian people. Right? If the Palestinian people establish a socialist state, I don't think they'd be saying the same thing. In fact, I'm certain they wouldn't be saying the same thing because it's not what they say about Cuba. It's not what they say about Nicaragua. It's not what they say about China. It's not it. on and on and on, right? And, which is not to say, of course, I would never advocate for a kind of you know, blind engagement where you just say, well, everything that is a, 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 a state that presents itself as socialist should just be like blindly supported or it means that, you know, it's absolutely perfect or anything like that. On the contrary, I believe in a, a kind of dialectics of socialism where you have to look at all of the nuances and analyze them. But these people, these radical theorists on the compatible left, they don't do that. And in fact, one of the other amazing features of almost every single one of them is that They'll go on at length about how you cannot whisper in a hallway the slightest critique of Adorno unless you slept in his archive, read the personal letter that he sent to you on his deathbed, and you know, learned uh, all of the things that he himself studied, on and on and on. You can't be critical. But when it comes to actually existing socialism, not only can you be critical, you can be critical without ever having studied any aspect of it whatsoever. So people that I studied with, for the most part, they don't know anything about what's going on in the places that I've just named. They've never studied them seriously. Usually they don't have the language skills to do it anyway. They don't care. And they just say, it's all to be condemned, it's awful, and it's horrible. Right? And so what that is, is just a, a, a kind of ideological moral reflex that's ascientific, that's lacking in rigor, and that was also highly politically suspect. Because if, if there's a real problem with socialism, then let's figure out what it is. Let's study it, right? Let's figure out what's working and what's not working. And so that overall consensus within the compatible left, I think, is precisely why they've been shored up. And so the most famous Marxists in the world today are famous within the capitalist world. And they're famous for a reason. They're famous because they tow the line that needs to be towed. And that is that as bad as capitalism is, the alternative is much, much worse. And so not, what is to be done? The answer to Lenin's question, nothing at all but read my books. Right? And I can explain to you how horrible capitalism is and how we shouldn't be organized and shouldn't get involved in any way, shape, or form in supporting projects that might, if we studied them, be leveraging power away from global capital. Right? So it's a defeatist politics. It's a defeatist politics through and through. And of course, there are different versions of this. Right? I'll just give a quick shout out to my man Zizek, because he came out, uh, I mentioned this in French, but people might not have gotten it. He, of course, said that we should vote for Donald Trump in the most recent election. And his justification for that 
was, you, you might think, oh, he's a Marxist accelerationist, right? We vote for Trump, then it gets really bad, and then it's going to catapult the revolution, but no, hear me out. The reason we should vote for Trump is because that's going to force the Democratic Party to get really radical. And then the Democratic Party is going to, like, say this or something? I, I, I don't know. Like, he doesn't know anything about the history of the Democratic Party. And these myths have been going on again and again and again. Like, people were saying this about Reagan, people were saying, like, just know your history. 